Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. By now, you've probably had your first exam. I hope that went well for you. Today, we'll start a chapter that's got some very practical applications in chemistry and biology. It's the topic of spectroscopy. As you probably know, spectroscopy is the study of the interactions that occur between matter and light, and how we can use those interactions to identify molecules and understand chemical processes like reactions. To start off our discussion, let's remember a few things about light waves and the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's a picture of the spectrum. As you might remember from your physics courses, visible light is just a small portion of the total spectrum. Longer wavelengths are on this side of the spectrum, and they include infrared light, microwaves, and radio waves. At shorter wavelengths are ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. You might also remember that the wavelength and frequency of a photon are connected by this equation, where the wavelength has the symbol of the Greek letter lambda, and the frequency is the Greek letter nu. It's important to make a distinction between this symbol and the letter V, which we usually use for velocity. We'll see some equations in the same chapter that use one or the other of these symbols, and it can be confusing if you mistake a symbol meaning velocity for one meaning frequency, or vice versa. You can distinguish them because the symbol nu usually is drawn with curved sides, while the letter V is usually written with straight lines. You've probably also seen this equation before, which shows the connection between a photon's frequency and its energy. An important thing to think about in these two equations is the units of the different quantities. In order for the units to work out, the wavelength needs to be in meters, the frequency is in reciprocal seconds, also known as hertz, and the energy is in joules. This is important to keep in mind, especially when it comes to the wavelength, because we often use units other than meters when talking about wavelength. For example, it's common to use nanometers when talking about visible light, reciprocal centimeters when talking about infrared light, or millimeters when discussing microwaves. If you do have a wavelength in one of those units, you'll need to convert it to meters before using it in these equations. For example, suppose we're interested in the molecule butanol, and we want to know more about the stretching vibration that occurs in the carbon-oxygen double bond. So we take an IR spectrum, and we find out that the carbon-oxygen stretch occurs with a frequency of 1,731 reciprocal centimeters. What would be the wavelength, frequency, and energy in SI units? First, let's think about the unit our data is in. This unit is telling us that there are 1,731 waves per centimeter, which actually makes it a way of expressing the frequency of the wave rather than its wavelength. When we express the frequency in reciprocal centimeters, or reciprocal meters, we often call the unit wave numbers. Since wave numbers can use either centimeters or meters, it's important to know which unit we're using when you see the word wave number. The symbol we use for wave numbers is the Greek letter nu with a horizontal bar above it. Anyway, let's change this into SI units for wavelength, frequency, and energy. Changing wave numbers to wavelength is very easy. We just take the reciprocal. When we do that, we get 5.777 times 10 to the negative fourth centimeters, which is 5.777 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. So that's the wavelength. Now we can use this equation to get the frequency. As you might remember, c is the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That gives us a frequency of 5.190 times 10 to the 13th seconds to the minus 1. Finally, let's use this equation to find the energy of this vibration. When we do, we find that the energy is 3.439 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. 
Before we move on, it'd be a good idea for us to review a couple more units that you might not be familiar with. First of all, let's think about the length of a chemical bond. For example, the carbon-oxygen double bond in CO2 has a length of 0.000000000156 meters. Of course, we usually wouldn't write it that way. It would make much more sense to use scientific notation, which would make it 1.156 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. We could also give that in nanometers, which would give us 0 0.1156 nanometers. So the length of a chemical bond is even less than a nanometer. For that reason, we often use different units for a bond length. One common unit is the angstrom, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. That would make the carbon-oxygen bond 1.156 angstroms. It's also common to give bond lengths in picometers. A picometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So that would make our bond 115.6 picometers. So, now we're ready to talk about spectroscopy in a little more depth. As I mentioned earlier, spectroscopy is the study of how light and matter interact. When a molecule absorbs a photon, the energy of the photon is transformed into kinetic and potential energy in the molecule. When the energy of the molecule increases, there are a few different things that could happen. First, one or more electrons in the molecule could move into a higher energy level. Also, the molecule could vibrate or rotate more quickly. It can be difficult to visualize how a photon could be transformed into those types of energy. The reason we might have trouble picturing this is because we usually fall into the habit of thinking of a photon as a particle, and this is actually a poor model if we want to understand how photons interact with matter. It's better to think of it as a wave, but even that can be misleading unless we keep in mind exactly what light waves are like. Remember, a light wave is an electromagnetic wave. That means it's made of both an oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field. If we try to picture a light wave like an ordinary sine wave, we're actually only drawing one of those oscillating fields. The other field, oscillates at a right angle to the first one, so a picture like this would be a bit more realistic. So that's what the electric and magnetic fields of a photon are like. And as you can imagine, a molecule also has an electric and a magnetic field, thanks to the electrons and protons in the molecule. When a photon and a molecule meet, it's their electric and magnetic fields that are actually interacting. For now, we're just going to talk about the electrical interactions. The magnetic interactions are important too, but we'll worry about those when we talk about NMR spectroscopy later on in the course. When we talk about UV-Vis spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, or rotational spectroscopy, it's the electrical interactions that we're observing, and that's what we'll talk about for the next several videos. For most types of spectroscopy we'll talk about, the photons are interacting with the electrons rather than the nuclei. That means it's the properties of the electrons that we need to worry about. As it turns out, the angular momentum of the electron is particularly important in spectroscopy. So here's an important thing to remember. Electrons have different types of angular momentum. There's orbital angular momentum, which we get the symbol of a script letter L, and there's spin angular momentum, which has the symbol s. It turns out that, just like electrons, photons also have a momentum and a spin. So when a photon and a molecule interact, the photon's momentum is transferred to the electrons in the molecule. Since momentum and energy are related, absorbing a photon's momentum results in an increase in the electron's energy which means that the electron's energy level increases. Of course, an electron's energy level can also decrease if it emits a photon. Let's think a little more carefully about the ways that an electron's energy level can change as a result of interactions with a photon.
This was a question that our old friend Albert Einstein thought deeply about, and he concluded that there are actually three different processes that can result from the interaction between an electron and a photon. First, suppose we have an electron in an excited state, which we'll call K. That's basically anything other than the lowest energy level, which is called the ground state. A system is always more stable when it has the lowest possible potential energy. So sooner or later, the excited electron will return to a lower energy level, which we'll call I. It releases excess energy as a photon when it does that. The wavelength and frequency of the emitted photon will depend on the difference in energy between the two levels. This process happens all by itself, so Einstein called it spontaneous emission. A second way that an electron can change its energy level is a bit less familiar to most people. It turns out that if we have an electron in an excited state K, it's possible to make the electron drop into a lower level I by hitting the electron with a photon that has exactly the same energy as the energy difference between the two levels. That makes the electron drop into the lower level, and when it does that, it emits a photon of its own, just like in spontaneous emission. So, basically, one photon enters the molecule, and two photons emerge. The original one, and the one emitted by the electron, both of which have the same wavelength. This process is called stimulated emission because we're stimulating the electron to drop into a lower energy level by hitting it with a photon. As we'll see later in this course, this process is the key to understanding how lasers work. In fact, the word laser is actually an acronym for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. So you can tell that stimulated emission is a crucial part of the operation of a laser. The third process that results in an electron changing its energy level is absorption, which you're already familiar with. In absorption, the electron starts at a low energy level I, and it moves to a higher energy level we'll call K. So far, so good. But Einstein wasn't done thinking about this topic yet. He was interested in understanding how the number of electrons in the upper and lower levels, which we usually call the populations of the energy levels, change with time as a result of those three processes. For example, take spontaneous emission. We can think of this as a process similar to a chemical reaction. We begin with an electron in an upper level K, so that would be like our reactant, and as a result of the spontaneous emission, the electrons end up in a lower level I. As you might recall from PCHEM 1, if we think about this as though it's a first order reaction, we can write a rate law for it. Our rate here is the change in the population of the upper level with time. So that'll be dNK over dt. On the right side of the equation, we'll have negative nk times a constant aki. The negative sign is there because the population of the upper state is decreasing when the spontaneous emission happens. The constant aki is called the Einstein constant of spontaneous emission, and its value is different depending on the system. We'll talk about how to determine it a little later in this video. There's a similar equation for the process of stimulated emission. Here's that one. Again, our reactants are the electrons in the upper energy level, so that's what we're determining the rate with respect to. Once again, we have negative nk times a constant, this time with the symbol bki. This time, we also have this additional factor, which is called the energy density, and it has the symbol of the Greek letter rho. The energy density tells us the strength of the electromagnetic field in the molecule's environment. In other words, it's the energy density of the light that's shining on it. As you might guess, the more photons we hit the molecule with, the more likely it is that will cause stimulated emission to occur, and that's reflected by the factor rho. 
The constant BKI is called the Einstein coefficient of stimulated emission, and it turns out that it's equal to the expectation value of the electric dipole moment of the molecule. By the way, the electric dipole moment has the symbol P, but it's not at all related to the momentum. Unfortunately, that can be a little bit confusing. The final equation is for absorption, which is this. This time, electrons are moving from a lower energy level I to an upper level K. So our reactants are the electrons in level I. So that's what we take the rate with respect to. Once again, we have a negative sign because the population of the lower level decreases when absorption occurs. As you would probably guess, the constant BIK is called the Einstein coefficient of absorption. As it turns out, the three Einstein coefficients are connected. BKI and BIK are actually equal to one another, and the coefficients of spontaneous and stimulated emission are related by this equation. As you can see, the connection between the two constants depends on the wavelength of the photons. Since the three constants are all connected, if we know one of them, we can calculate all three, and that can allow us to determine how the populations of the upper and lower energy levels change with time. Well, that's enough new material for now. We'll start delving a little deeper into the mathematics of spectroscopy when we meet next time, including a form of spectroscopy that you might not be familiar with, rotational spectroscopy. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.